the fence, we put the fun in fungi as we visit a Vermont company that specializes in mycology. And we say farewell to a longtime friend who is setting off on a new adventure. Good afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. Scientists have determined that the largest living organism on Earth isn't flora or fauna, it's a mushroom. A humongous fungus in eastern Oregon spreads out over three miles and weighs more than a combined weight of 20 gray whales. Well, big or small, mushrooms are a curious life form, and a business in Morristown has found a way to carry its love of mushrooms to market. Across the fences, Keith Silva has our story. Alien and strange, and yet familiar and earthy. Mushrooms are as unique as they are common. And they taste good, too. Well, at least some people think so. People are like, oh my God, I love mushrooms. Or they're like, ugh, I hate mushrooms. So you never find anybody that says like, they are lukewarm. You know, either you hate them or love them. Where's the spawn, sweetheart? You wanna get the spawn, Monica right? Gallardo and her husband, Jason Bednars, own Motown Mushrooms in Morristown. Oh, that's a Bednars is a jack of all trades. A carpenter and sometimes chef, he started growing gourmet mushrooms as a hobby and selling his crop to his fellow chefs. It didn't take long before demand exceeded supply. Chefs always like the weirdest thing they can put on the plate, and so at least the better ones. Um, and so if you can show them a product they've never seen before, or their even better, their customers have never seen before, you get this wow factor. And so they're always interested in, in not only you know fresh and local, but completely new flavors and textures. As a carpenter, I often get slow come January, and usually when that happens, I launch into projects. And so the project that year was to build my, my flow hood uh, and my big sterilizer to step up the mushroom growing game. Growing mushrooms breaks down into two categories, propagation and cultivation. The flow hood Bednar's built in his basement allows him to work in a sterile, lab-like setting and produce specific varieties of mushrooms like oyster, lion's mane, and hen of the woods. We start with petri dish, which is a, a agar medium, which is a nutrient medium, which uh, allows the mushroom mycelium to grow, and that's sterile. As the mycelium grows, I check for contaminants. Once I have clean mycelium, I go to the sterilized grain, and that allows the mushroom mycelium to propagate out from the, uh, the inoculation points and colonize the substrate. This I can expand into 10 more jars, and so I keep making what are called generations of grain spawn, and they get bigger by a factor of, say, eight to 10 every time I expand it. And so it's a series of expansions, and you start with a small speck of mycelium, and you grow it out to its physical limits, and then you use it to fruit mushrooms. Saw something an off-color brown in here. There's, there's at least 10,000 species of mushrooms, and it's a constant process to learn more and more species. Terry Delaney Some teaches the biology are, of fungi uh, at the University of Vermont. Across the fence followed Delaney on a mushroom foraging field trip a few years ago. The connection between fungi and humans goes back centuries to a time when mushrooms were considered the food of the gods. There are um, documented uh, fungi in the form of stone carvings uh, from uh, uh, thousands of years ago. In fact, the Egyptian pharaohs even apparently uh, uh, consumed mushrooms. In fact, they were uh, privileged to be the people who could consume mushrooms in their, in their society. Foraging for wild mushrooms continues to be a tried and true practice for finding favorite fungi. But commercial mushroom production has also ramped up in recent years because of how easy and profitable it is to grow mushrooms. Many species of mushrooms are, are very easy to cultivate. And the oyster mushroom is a good example. It will grow on almost anything. I even saw a fellow grow some mushrooms on an old t-shirt that he had inoculated. Uh, so that particular mushroom grows very well. It's also a very uh, effective uh, decay fungus in the forest, and we'll find that on decaying logs. Oyster mushrooms have become the meat and potatoes of Motown Mushrooms' business plan, thanks in part to the fungipale. Bednars and Gallardo developed this grow-your-own kit which packs mycelium and eight pounds of pasteurized straw into a two and a half gallon pail, 29.99.
everything that the mushroom needs to grow is inside. In fact, by the time you get it, it's already well on its way to producing its first crop of mushrooms. So the mycelium will colonize that substrate. And when it finds the holes, uh, it, it senses the light and the fresh air, and it'll begin to produce little baby mushrooms, which will rapidly expand over about a week to full size. And so, I mean, it's pretty hard. Our biggest problem with it is actually keeping them from fruiting before we can get them to the customer, um, because they are like little biological bombs. They, they will produce mushrooms no matter pretty much what you do uh, over about, uh, about three weeks from when you make it. And I've had friends that forget them in the trunk of their car, in their closet, and they've erupted into giant mushrooms. The fungipales allow Bednars and Gallardo to spread their love of mushrooms and to teach people how to grow their own food. People are uh, um, really looking to uh, get uh, uh, first local foods, uh, uh, foods that are like really uh, beneficial for you, and uh, um, also they support a small business. The fact that you can grow it your own, and you know that these mushrooms don't have any pesticides, they don't have any byproducts, anything like weird being added to them. Uh, you know where your food is coming from. I think people uh, find that uh, very valuable. We love uh, teaching people how to grow their own mushrooms, teaching them about the advantages of, of consuming your own food. I love it. I, I never thought that I was going to be a mushroom farmer. If you asked me 10 years ago, I would be like, what? <laughs> but uh, I'm, I'm really into it now and I, I we really love it. Watching mushrooms grow is still exciting even after all this time. It's so fast, they're so alien, um, they're so amazing in flavor. They're uh, ridiculously efficient at converting cellulose into protein, which is like one of the big problems in nature is what do you do with this woody cellulose material? And if it wasn't for mushrooms, we'd be buried in leaves and, and logs that never rot. Um, and so they're this integral, poorly understood part of the, uh, the, the na of nature, and it's it's great to be able to get in there and, and monkey around with it and experiment and, and see what does what. From pails, on logs, or in the wild, fungi are apt to mushroom just about anywhere. What can we say? Fungi are fun and delicious. Well, maybe. In Morristown, I'm Keith Silva for the Crossing Lines. You can find out more about Motown Mushrooms by visiting their website, MotownMushrooms.com, or you can call the company at 802-851-8222. That's 851-8222. Well, today we say farewell to a longtime friend and frequent contributor to Across the Fence. After 15 years as UVM Extension's equine specialist, Betsy Green has accepted a professorship at the University of Arizona. Will Michael reflects on Betsy's dedication to Vermonters and her commitment to education. We have the survey. We have the info on which two bills. So Thursday. From the classroom to the saddle, Betsy Green has been Vermont's top horse educator for more than 15 years. And she is the equine specialist for UVM Extension. And welcome back to the show. Thank you. Betsy's passion for equine science led her to start the popular annual Everything Equine event. The event was held April 24th and 25th this past April, and it was a wonderful event at Champlain Valley Exposition. And we had an excellent attendance, about 5,000 people. She oversaw Everything Equine as it grew from year to year. It's crazy, a decade, and our theme is a decade of equine education. Mm -hmm. And so we're really thrilled to have maintained such a good, great program for so long. Through the Everything Equine event, Betsy brought the world's top trainers and educators to Vermont and to Across the Fence. We met professionals like Jane Savoy, Dan James, and David Davis. And over the years, Betsy brought education professionals to Vermont to help Vermonters solve real world problems. I brought along Dr. Carrie Williams from Rutgers, and she's somebody I've worked with for years through e-extension and through our equine environmental research projects, and that's why we brought her up here to Vermont. We Betsy also connected us with our fellow Vermonters. We're a nonprofit organization, and we're located in Hinesburg at Lakota Way Farm, just about 25 minutes south of Burlington. So what did you do as a teaching assistant at the Morgan Horse Farm? I am a teaching assistant for Dr. Green, mm -hmm. and I help with lecture and lab activities. There's been at least six good hard Betsy's mission right? was always about education, and that was on full display when Tropical Storm Irene hit in 2011. 
if the pasture was underwater and you can see the dirt and silt, don't use it. Don't put your horses in it. It's just too high a risk because the horses are not adapted to dealing with toxins or dirt or things like that. And they, they could easily colic and then you have a much higher cost when you lose the horse. Betsy's work earned local and national awards. In 2010, she was honored with UVM's Kerrigan Award for Excellence in Teaching. And earlier this year, she won the Professional of the Year Award from the Joint Council of Extension Professionals. The heart and soul of Betsy's work is in teaching others. Her love of horses and people led her to co-produce a nationally recognized public service announcement on horse safety. Motorists should slow down and pass wide around the horse. Behind the serious messages she helped convey during her time at UVM, Betsy remains a kid at heart, and we wish her luck at the University of Arizona. Well, Betsy joins me now in the studio. First of all, congratulations on your new position at the University of Arizona. It's going to be a bit of a homecoming for you. Yes, uh, I finished, I did my master's there in 1989, so if you do the math, that's over a quarter of a <laughs> century since I lived there. Mm -hmm. But I have maintained great relationships and friendships with folks there, and also through the ag agents work, national leadership. I have a lot of extension colleagues that I already go in knowing, and I'm looking forward to building relationships with others too. So you're gonna be teaching and doing educational outreach? Yeah, yeah, it's a fairly parallel position. I'll go in as a full professor and the horse extension specialist. And so, you know, about 30% of my time will be teaching and equine program coordinator, and then the other 70% is extension. And I'll have quite a bit of work with the 4-H folks there. Mm -hmm. And so helping with the programs that are existing as well as uh, creating new educational opportunities. So as we saw in the videos, you forged a lot of relationships here <laughs> in Vermont. And as we reflect on your work, what's been the most meaningful to you? And, and so how long do we have? <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I guess the, as I think about it, the one thing that comes up is that everything that I talk about is intertwined and interwoven. And that's not been by chance, because if you look at the people that I've worked with through mm -hmm. the state, um, high caliber and quality of folks, both at the university, from my colleagues and peers and the staff in the department, all the way up through the faculty senate executive committee, and just folks working to make a difference, to make the best opportunity for the students, and also research, teaching, extension as well. And then you look at colleagues and friends and work, you know, working relationships outside. Well, my extension colleagues in the field, I've worked so closely with them on so many different things. Right. And, and then even the industry members. So if you, I mean, think back to some of the things we've talked about on this show. Right. <laughs> Everything equine. Uh, I couldn't have done it without, you know, support from Jane O'Neill, Frank Kinghorn, and Marsha Purvis, our staff in the department, as well as industry members, guys, Farm and Yard, Champlain Valley Expo, right. all of those people, and then all the professionals, both nationally and internationally, to provide opportunities and, and partnerships. It was win-win is my best option, to, you know, when I'm looking at stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, tremendously successful. Is there a message that you want to share with the Vermont horse industry? Well, I think that it, the industry is vibrant and strong, and, and that's one thing that folks I think perhaps it was under-recognized mm -hmm. and perhaps a little underserved, and I am concerned about that as I go to my new adventures. But we have really done a lot to try and get people in and outside of the industry aware of all the value that this industry brings to Vermont as agriculture and otherwise. Right. And, you know, I've done that through Farm Bureau. I've done that earlier on much more through the Vermont Horse Council and through the Everything Equine and, and also just also helping them know that they need to step up and say, I am part of the agricultural right. community. Be more active. Be more active themselves rather than just hiding <laughs> and hoping. Right. <laughs> what are you most looking forward to with this new adventure? Well, I think one of the things they have, they have a herd of horses. They have stallions and mares and brood mares and foals and school horses. So that'll be something where the students have hands-on opportunities.
You know, one of the things I actually will miss is working with you on Across the Fence because this has been a way for us to let the rest of the general public and industry know what's going on, programs and, you know, in equine industry, Farm Bureau, all mm -hmm. of those. So that's been really a great way to get the word out. And I'd like to thank you for your help personally. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime I needed hay, I'd call you or text you and you could be anywhere in the country and you always got back to me with advice and so forth and, you know, even um, made a site visit to my farm when I was having an issue with mud. <laughs> and even though I haven't tackled that yet, at least now I know the correct way to do that. So I want to thank you very much for for that, and I will miss you dearly. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you very much. And don't forget to stop by and see us when you come back to Vermont. Maybe in the fall. Yeah. <laughs>